Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about that. That was, um, we just had to unmute quickly. My name is Yugen Pele. I'll be your program director for today's webinar. Uh, I head up business consulting at SNG Grand Thornton. Fun fact, did you know that 33 years ago, SNG Grand Thornton was a small SME in a township and that today we're one of the largest accounting, consulting and auditing firms in Africa? Well, in essence, that's what the B codes are all about. That's what it's trying to achieve, how to obtain growth for, for, for small up and coming black businesses and keeping them um, su sustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue, let's I want to take you to some house rules. All right. So in terms of, of going forward, um, all microphones will be muted. However, questions and answers will be conducted in the chat box. If you have any questions, please pop it onto the chat box at the end of the session. I will then um, correspond with, with Tony and we'll go through the questions and he'll give the answers um, live to you. Um, if you cannot see any slides, please indicate on the chat box as well. There are approximately uh, 10 seconds delay depending on, on, on your, your network and Wi-Fi connection. So please give it a, a 10 sec uh, uh, se second start. And if you still can see, please let us know immediately. Uh, please note that this session will be recorded. So today, ladies and gentlemen, it, I'd like to present Mr. Tony Belch. It's an absolute pleasure and privilege. Um, Tony is a fellow partner at SNG Grand Thornton. He heads up the, the firm's BE division and is also a provisional leader uh, in Eastern Cape. So Tony's expertise uh, includes verification as well as consulting. Now, it's, it's very rare that you find somebody with this type of experience what Tony does is he doesn't only go, uh, doesn't only provide services to public uh, companies, but also to private, to multinationals, and to state-owned enterprises. So that's a whole host of clients that Tony has. And just to prove what type of leader Tony is, what do you do once you get that vast amount of experience? Well, what Tony has done is he has taken that experience and put it into books. He has authored many books on the subject of, um, of, of the BE codes. And the idea is, and especially is to teach others such that they'll be able to carry it forward. Tony has also done many articles uh, on the subject as well as many television presentations. Um, and when we have a look at, uh, at Tony's portfolio, it is so vast. But these are some of the major clients that he has worked with uh, and, and, has, and continue to help today. Um, that is British American Tobacco, BMW, Nestle, Mondi, All Mutual, Alton Group, and Woolworths. Without any further ado, I would like to now hand you over to Tony so that he'll be able to take us through the rest of the webinar. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will chat to you later again. Enjoy your webinar. Thank you, Jürgen. I'm not too sure if you can hear me, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're just getting the um, technology up and running. Right, we should have it there. All right, so it's a pleasure to, to be part of the session today um, and thank you for the opportunity to address you as participants, um, clients and, and, and colleagues here today. And I'm going to really be focusing on four aspects of the BE um, codes and the environment in order to um, optimize the efficiency and effectiveness of your scorecard, particularly as, as we've had four weeks of lockdown. I must say this is the first time that I've put on a tie and jacket. I just wanted to make sure that um, it, still, it still fits. Um, but with the we inclement weather that's coming through at the moment, um, I feel quite comfortable with it. So what we're going to be doing today is, is to, and if I could just kick off by looking at a few C's, the, the, the letter C. Um, and what we did with lockdown and this whole thing came through in, in March was we had to focus on our colleagues 
Um, how's our business going to operate? Can we operate remotely? Um, do we need to close our business? Um, some had to close permanently um, and many temporarily. And we'll see a video in terms of somebody in the um, in the fast food sector, um, how they handled it. And then what we are going to look at as, as well is we're going to look at these codes that um, came through and were effective um, with effect from the 1st of December. And many of you are facing those right now in terms of complying with those codes. So the compliance would have had to have happened probably if you've been verified already. But then as businesses, we had to look at, at, at cash flow and how do we have cash flow and engage um, suppliers, engage clients and have some, some difficult conversations but really to find a middle ground in terms of that. Um, then we had to actually, with our clients, um, how do we relate to our clients? Um, what technology can we use? So we as a firm, and I'll talk about it just now, we're able to put a paperless system in, in place. Uh, the on-site verifications we could handle remotely, and we had been developing for about nine months a system that was able to, to go live um, from April. So we have completed um, 23 verifications already, uh, which include two listed, um, probably the world's largest um, multinational, um, extremely large international consulting businesses, um, and being able to, to complete their verification and issue their certificate success, successfully. Businesses have to continue, notwithstanding COVID, and so we're going to be talking about an aspect of continuing to operate, which is really the compliance. Um, the, uh, as you know, BE is voluntary in terms of compliance, um, but if we're going to remain competitive and be able to operate, put tenders in, supply to large organizations that are requiring our BE certificates, um, just to let me state that um, if you're hoping there's going to be a silver bullet or some magic there that they've been suspended BE, it hasn't been suspended. Um, it's really a dispensation and a delay that was granted in terms of listed companies submitting information to the BE Commission. And it also, uh, in terms of the verification, we could do verification um, remotely. So we'll we'll talk about, about that as well. So let's just, just kick off and get into these amended codes and, and what became effective from, from the 1st of December and what changed in terms of the scorecard. Well, there were really two of the five elements of the scorecard. And we'll talk about the fact that it just really relates to the generic entities, except the one or two of the definitions um, were clarified, and that um, does have an impact on your, your QECs as well. So in terms of the skills development element, um, Code Series 300, there was a change there. Supply enterprise, that's where the most significant change incidentally was and what we'll focus on. Supply and enterprises develop in a couple more points. And then the general principles and the, some of the definitions we will talk about today. Right, so how does this impact on sector codes? No, it doesn't. It's the generic scorecard, but we'll see. If you just look at these, this list that, you, that I've put up in terms of sector codes, so tourism sector codes, um, the tourism sector has really been knocked heavily um, with the lockdown, um, with the pandemic and its, its impact. And um, we have clients in the sector, there were clients that we had started the verification prior to lockdown and it's just been, been, been put on hold. So it's really, really been tough for them. Another sector is the property sector. Um, and there again, there's been discussions and negotiations and SAPOA and all sorts of people getting involved in that. Um, but they've been particularly hammered with the um, with the lockdown. And then we see other sectors like ICT and all the rest of it uh, moving ahead at, at, at pace. And we've just seen how important technology is in terms of being able to, to, to work remotely. Um, so I've got colleagues on this um, in Pretoria. I'm down in East London. We've got other people in Johannesburg that are all part of the um, this um, webinar that we're presenting to you. So just to state that these amendments that we're talking about do not relate to the sector codes. Watch, there may well be um, amendments that come through. As you know, the old transport sector is still in place. One that's not in here is the defence sector. Um, but I've just put some, the, the others up just to show you. Um, uh, you know, construction sector, there are a lot of nuances around the construction sector, not that they've changed um, since, since 2017, um, but um, construction sector has got some nuances that need to be flagged because um, they are affected um, in terms of some of the definitions. 
All right, when we talk about your BE recognition level, this is really what is it's all about. Um, we have a level one contributor, um, and that's if you achieve these number of points. Please note in terms of ITC, ITC sector and um, the um, construction sector, financial services, there, there are there sometimes different um, recognition levels and, and targets that, uh, that do apply. This is generally what it is. So if you get um, between 90 and 95 points, but you haven't achieved, for example, a target or one of the three elements you get taken down a level, so you may well be at, at, at the level four, and I'm going to be talking um, about that later as well. This slide I'm putting it up very briefly. Um, this generally relates in the generic scorecard. These amendments, as I said, to companies whose turnover exceeds 50 million. We have the so-called QSEs, um, where the revenue is between 10 and 50 million. Again, different thresholds under some of the other sector codes and exempt micro enterprises with um, a turnover of 10 million or less. And then if you've got 51% black ownership, and I'm going to finish off talking about that, um, you will um, need to have a look at your ownership um, um, structures. But um, and the benefits of those, even the generic scorecard in terms of your clients. Um, but if you're under 50 million, 51% black owned, you only need to make an affidavit and not go through the verification um, process. Um, this slide here talks about the number of points, and I've indicated in red just that it went from 40 points, plus the four bonus points, to 42 points under enterprise and supplier development. But under skills development, they, although the number of points stayed the same, there was um, a significant change in the, in the scorecard, as we will see now, talking about statement statement 300. So number of points, including most points, remaining at 25, but there was a new category, this category of, of, of bursaries. And then um, there was a removal of a section, a whole four points, and we can see, we'll see where that was um, added back. So in terms of the um, skills development expenditure on learning programs, in terms of the learning program matrix, um, I'm not going to put that up um, today, but the number of points has reduced in terms of that first line from eight down to six points, but the target also reduced um, to 3.5% of the leviable amount um, and so effectively it's spreading over, spread over two categories, um, that compliance target, uh, which is still there and it's still high. Um, and so the new category that was introduced was bursaries for black students at higher educational institutions. And that was for four waiting points with the expenditure compliance target of 2.5. So we had the 3.5 um, in the first line, we now got the, the, the remaining 2.5% uh, of, of, of the target here. And we need to um, embrace this because this is a number of points. It's four points on, on, on your scorecard. And when you do your gap analysis and that, when you look at this, um, do focus on this because suddenly we finding clients realize that they're not getting those points because they didn't engage in the spend prior to the end of their, their measurement period. Right, and in the category of learnerships and uh, apprenticeships, the compliance target was increased to, to 5% and the number of waiting points was actually increased to, to 6. Um, previously, it was 2.5% and the waiting points were 4, but um, we have effectively, the targets increased by 100%, but the number of points has, has, has increased by 50% by 50, 50 if you're interested in playing the, the percentage games. Life's not fair, you've got to get on with it, and uh, I think we need to accept that in relation to this and look at where the opportunities lie in relation to, to, to learnerships, and that percentage is of your total employees um, in your organization. So yeah, you have it in terms of what you would typically know as the, the, the scorecard. We can see the um, skills development spend, the total uh, being reduced from eight to six, the target from 3.5, uh, from, from 6% down to 3.5. The new category of skills development spend on bursaries, um, and uh, there's four waiting points there, which are a significant number of points. In terms of disabled employees, that, that did not change. Um, and here in terms of encouraging um, employers in terms of learnerships, apprenticeships and internships, um, increased to six points and the target has increased. You can see the line that I've drawn through that, that category of unemployed people participating um, has been a specific um, point here, but we'll see just now that you can actually include that spend still in terms of your um, skills development spend. 
and then the absorption category is still there. Right. Um, so another thing that is important is remember there's, there's the sub minimums that, that need to be achieved and please remember that that 40% sub minimum rule relates to 40% of the um, waiting points and excludes your bonus points. Um, sometimes people miss that in terms of um, that um, target being based on the 20 points and not the 25. The 3.5% compliance target on skills development spend, um, it, it now excludes external training for unemployed black people. So they brought that, although they've removed it, they're allowing you to include it in your total skills development um, spend. Right, in terms of your spend on training accommodation and not sticking people on first class, class flights to London, not that would have helped in the, in the, in the lockdown period, but still um, that is limited to 15% of your of the value of your total skills development expenditure that you you can claim um, and the category f and g um, was capped at, at 25 and it was previously um, 15 so that that has moved up in terms of um, salaries and wages to to um, employees participating in, in in the programs or stipends that are paid um, to and linked to bursary uh, programs, and this is in relation to bursaries in terms of higher educational institutions. So effectively now, um, salaries and wages that are paid to these employees or those receiving the stipend um, on your, um, your, your um, learning program matrix um, covers your, all your categories from A now through to, to, to D, whereas before it was B, C and D. All right, if you look at the learning program matrix, um, the narrative description is, and they talk about programs, bursaries or scholarships. Um, they need to be formally addressed by educational institutions, which is your Department of Basic Education and your Department of Higher Education. Um, it's institutional instruction, um, and obviously uh, the learning sites of the university, colleges, schools, um, formal abbots. And then in terms of the learning achieved is a diploma or certificate that is issued by an accredited or registered um, formal institution of learning. So those are your category A, A programs. Um, there's, there's no cap in terms of the um, percentage that is, is spent in terms of legitimate um, training costs for bursaries or scholarships. So it's uh, payment of school, college or varsity fees, funding of textbooks and subsistence and accommodation as well. All right, um, moving on to statement 400 and the changes that came through there in terms of the procurement scorecard. Um, the, the, there was really just two additional points that, that were added. So it takes it, so if you measured out of 100 points, you can see it's been taken um, to 46 points. It was previously um, 44 points. And where the extra two points came in is in terms of the spend with um, suppliers that are at least 51% um, black owned. Um, and so that is a significant number of points. People often just focus, are there a level um, one, two, three, four, down, down to eight. Um, and they say, well, we were a level one supplier. Um, and in terms of our clients, they're really not that interested in us because they've already got the five points. What they're looking for is dealing with organizations that are 51 or more percent black owned. Um, and then we see um, the target still remains in terms of businesses that are 30% um, black woman owned. So here's your scorecard over here. And um, we can see the compliance target of 50%. The one thing to note as well, although the number of points has increased in terms of, of, of black owned, owned businesses, um, that the target has actually increased now from 40% to 50% to of the spend. And that's why when you're dealing with um, large organizations, so if you're dealing with the motor industry um, and large multinationals, often they've, they're not getting points um, in terms of ownership but they want to be BE compliant. And because they haven't got ownership there, they have to get to at least the number of points for a level seven supplier. So they focus, um, believe you me, on, on, on these categories here in terms of suppliers that are 30% black women owned and or 50% black owned. Um, also your QSEs and exempt micro enterprises um, 
need to make up, and there's, those targets have remained the same in terms of 15% of their spend. But for for very large companies, and that um, these targets are hard hard to achieve, and that's why they start moving down and looking at businesses that are 51% black owned. There's your target of 12% to achieve your four points in terms of black black women owned, and then bonus points in terms of designated groups. And we'll see um, and these designated groups um, effectively entities that are 51% um, black owned by these designated groups. So there are two additional points there. And it's very interesting how fractions of points come into play. So you need to do the gap analysis. Um, looking and, and, and striving to, to get those points because sometimes companies find themselves, you know, 0.7 of a point away from the, being at the next next level. All right, um, and then we've got supplier development um, con contributions here. Um, in terms of, um, and we'll look at some of the definitions and they've defined what is a supplier and, and, and what is enterprise or so-called SD and, and ED and, and Jürgen and his division in Pretoria do a lot of work in the space assisting companies in terms of um, assisting the QSDs and the EMEs that qualify that are 51% black owned and link them into these um, organizations so that the funds can flow and they can get the recognition for that. And then there's bonus points in terms of the graduation from being an enterprise supplier to a supplier. And we'll see in the definitions are simply uh, the, that supply is on the database and supplying the company um, directly, not just the recipient of a beneficiary, but actually supplying um, uh, goods or services um, to the measured measured entity. And then in terms of a job being created, um, there's an additional um, bonus point that is available as well. So that's under enterprise and supply and development. Then they clarified the definition in terms of um, the do, when you do the calculations and it's benchmarked and it's against net profit after tax and they described it in more detail, which there's a lot of gaps in the, the, the codes of good practice, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And so well, they haven't addressed all of them. They've addressed some of them. And this was a clarification, which ended up, it was defined under socioeconomic development, but not under supply and enterprise development. And if the impact is, uh, is, is um, below a certain threshold, or if the company doesn't make a profit, you need to go and look over the last five years, take the average of that, and if it is still less than a quarter of the industry normal, then you apply the um, the quarter of the industry norm in terms of that 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 impact. Um, we haven't seen people use turnover um, and the turnover option that is available there. All right, understand please that the beneficiaries of supply and enterprise development need to be EMEs or QSEs. And what they added here was there is a provisor with generic entities. Understand that these EMEs and QSEs need to be 51% black owned. But when that, even the entity has gone from being an EME or QSE into a generic enterprise, um, there's a period of, of, of five years from the first time of receiving assistance from the measured entity um, in terms of, although they graduate and become a generic enterprise, you can continue to get the recognition for the spend with those with those entities. There was also a multiplier of 1.2 in relation to the purchases that were made um, from entities that are 51% black owned. Um, guarantees, if you you remember, in 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 terms of the benefit factor matrix. Um, there's a real anomaly of, um, you know, they had 3% um, would, of a guarantee would be recognized. That must have been a typo when the um, earlier codes came out, those ones in 2013, I think they became effective in 2015. Uh, we've now got 50% of the guarantee provided by the beneficiary. That amount will be recognized um, under the benefit factor matrix. And supply development beneficiary that just defined needs to be part of measured entity supply chain. All right, then we got um, so those are the two elements of the scorecard that were addressed, and then they addressed statement um, triple naught, and they dealt with unincorporated joint ventures. We actually developed this methodology and applied it, and it has been accepted as the norm now. And one also picked it up uh, aspects of this under the construction sector code, which was used as a benchmark. But really what they're doing is they're talking about if you're an unincorporated joint venture, you need to consolidate your verification certificates. 
um, and um, to ensure and, and, and to get a score for the joint venture partners. And the weightings um, of that consolidation, obviously is out of 100, um, is in relation to the joint venture agreement, how the profits will and effectively economic interest be shared out between the respective parties. Um, and so these scores are based on the um, relative um, codes or score that is achieved by the various the various parties in proportionate to their um, share in the joint venture agreement out of 100. Um, if you deal with an EME and a QSC that hasn't hasn't got a scorecard, uh, what they state now is that if you're 51% black owned, you'll get 95 points, 100% black owned, 100 points, or EMEs um, without 51% or 100% black ownership um, will get a total of 85 points recognized there. All right, and then they clarify that it's the economic interest benefits voting rights that flow through and that certificate is valid for 12 months, but it, the, the problem is there is a cost in actually preparing these certificates by um, the SNS accredited verification agencies, but it's only applicable to that specific project, even if um, the joint ventures are staying the same in relation to um, other projects in the same proportion of, of, of profit share. All right, so they just the, the discounted level uh, needs to be recorded on, 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 the, on the scorecard and the status level in relation to that where an entity has been discounted. Remember, if you don't achieve the targets in relation to, um, in, in relation to ownership um, skills or procurement supply development, they're actually five. If you think of supply development and enterprise development, you get taken down one level. Eligibility as, as, a, as a QSC, they're saying basically if you want to be measured um, as a QSC in terms of the generic scorecard as an, or an EME in terms of the QS scorecard, you may do that clarifying the um, turnover threshold. Then also what came through at the same time and effective from the 1st of December was some definitions. And those definitions, probably this is the most um, important one and that relates to absorption. So where they talk about absorption, what they're saying is um, that individual securing in the measured entity um, a, a long-term contract of employment for the employee, learner, intern or apprentice, whoever that person was. But then they went on to define what is a long-term contract. And then basically it states that an individual must work until his or her mandatory date of retirement. Obviously they can, they can resign in all those in terms of a labor contract. But what they're saying is not in terms of a certain period contract. It needs to be a long-term contract of employment. So that, that, that came through in the clarification. Um, the cu current equity interest date of, of when it comes into effect, they, they've clarified that. When they talk about critical skills, they're referring to the actual applicable CETA um, and it's, it's that um, entity and the sector and the relevant CETA for that um, critical skill. Um, apprenticeships, um, we in, inserted the, the, the definition now. Designated groups in terms of, of being defined and 51% black owned of black unemployed people. Um, youth as, as defined, 35 or under, disabled persons, uh, people living in rural and underdeveloped areas, all well, the way the potholes are going anywhere I stay, I think we've become an underdeveloped area here, but anyway, be that as may, and then also military um, veterans. All right, 30% black woman owned, um, that's is it, it must be at least 30% before it, it, it meant that it had to be higher than. Um, qualifying enterprise and supplier development, uh, uh, again, just defining 51% black owned QSEs and EMEs, and then obviously there's a link now if they've graduated into being generic. And then they added something interesting, black youth in rural and underdeveloped areas. Right, the impact of, of COVID-19 and, and the response to it, um, and it's, it's been very interesting seeing how various entities have um, have um, responded to it. But, you know, as, as, as there's this great book uh, that Madiba wrote, wrote when he was still alive and, and this cartoon that came out under COVID and certainly the curve as well as drawn here isn't very accurate. But, you know, Madiba said after climbing a great hill, um, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. And um, we've seen this in terms of the challenges, and I don't think Eskom's added any, 
any benefit to to what we're already grappling with, and it's certainly impacting in terms of employees um, and even in terms of this webinar. It's impacting on people being able to be a part of it. People working remotely, working from home, generally don't have UPSs and that. Um, so there's a number of hills that we're having to continue to to, to climb. And for those who, you know, with the president's um, presentation on Sunday night, I was speaking to people yesterday and how they've been impacted on, uh, in terms of the liquor industry. And it's not just the, the retailer, it's the supply chain and all of those in that supply chain, uh, even to the vehicle getting the um, product um, to the retailer. Right, I'm going to play you a video now, which just gives you an indication of how it's impacted on, on some businesses and how they've, they've put a positive um, spin on it. We first turned the Nando's flame on in 1987. It was an exceptionally difficult time to start a business. The flame we lit that day has continued to burn, not only in that casa, but in thousands of cousins around the world. Today, we turn that flame off and the grills will go cold. This is the first time this will happen in South Africa. There are a lot of difficult first times happening in South Africa and in the world this week. But we don't do this with sadness. We do this with pride, with courage, with passion. We do this because for the first time, our flame must leave our home and go to yours and stay there for now. It's been called social distancing, but we like to think of it as social togetherness because we're in this together, even though for now we must be apart. Today, I feel energized and inspired. I have full confidence in our country, led by President Cyril Ramaphosa, and I'm beyond proud of the Nando's leadership and Nandokas who have stood as one and lived the Nando's values and purpose. The way we have behaved today will define our legacy way into the future. Together, we can flatten the curve. May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. And may you stay forever young. Stay safe, stay home, and when we're all ready, we'll fire it up once more. All right, so thanks very much to uh, Robbie Brosden and Nando's for that. But um, the field that I also specialize in is, is, is working with, with family and businesses, and we're going to be running a seminar in a couple of days' time. Uh, or a couple of weeks time um, in relation to that. And if you look at the Marriott story, I'll be showing some, some other videos. It's just very interesting to see how, the impact of it. And just talking in terms of our organization um, and, and continuing to do the verification, a, a lot of companies are very surprised that we've been able to, to as I said, complete those 23. We currently have 24 underway and we haven't blinked. We've been able to carry on. And one of the reasons is because Senes um, has allowed uh, and stated that as a verification agency, we can continue to perform the verification work, um, implementing uh, remote site assessments, and, and that they talk to that. Obviously, we need to um, uh, do the recordings of, of that, um, appropriate technology, um, but it certainly has worked and it's, it's demonstrated. Um, not only through this, but by going paperless. Um, and what Senes have done is they, they continue to extend it. The latest extension that we have is to 31st, 31 July. And my sense of it, it is going to be extended uh, um, into August at least, and, 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 and um, possibly um, September as well. So we've got to go through the whole verification process, but utilizing electronic means. And so what we did and how did we as SNG Grant Thornton respond? Fortunately, there's a program that I had put underway and, and, and um, started the development of um, this verification online management and documentation control system um, back in about July, August last year. 
um, and got traction on it um, Christmas time, um, January, February, and we were able to bring it on live, I think the second week um, of lockdown in, in, in April. Um, and it's been hugely, hugely successful um, for our clients. And so even, and it, it, it currently it only relates to the generic scorecard, but we use it as a document management and, and progress control system um, for our clients as, as well. And then the paperless verification uh, methodology. So uh, what is this VOS system all about? Um, and what are the benefits of it? Well, um, clients can um, s submit and, and, and track the information on the management system. Um, what you have is you have clients and, and it em embraces a number of disciplines and departments with, within the client. So you might have the, the finance department, the HR department, um, the supply chain department involved. Um, and so people are all working remotely. So from multiple sites, um, they were able to, to come onto this, this common flat platform that is secure, HTTPS, etc. Um, and they were able to uh, continue to, 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 to operate. Um, the, the people, the executives were able to, our uh, heads of sustainability or BE were able to monitor and, and check on the progress, both from the client side and our side. There's, there's obviously the two components to it um, in terms of uploading of, of, of schedules and, and handle the whole process um, dynamically, literally go on and can straight away see where um, the various parts of the process are and, and the people that are responding. And it, it's, it's secure access, passwords, etc., that we give to our clients and it certainly enhances communication um, and, and, and accountability. So what I'm going to bring up now is a screen from the client's point of view is right from the application, um, acceptance, uh, signing of the letter of engagement, um, proof of payment. Um, we then grant the clients access to it. You can see at the top of the page there whether that is completed in progress, whether it's been submitted to the ver VA, the verification analyst, or information outstanding. Um, and you can see the on the left hand side bar the various elements of, of the scorecard. So then we go through the planning process um, and then picking up on the on site visits um, information that um, has all been submitted and, and um, then, then the review. Sometimes we ask for additional information all the way through to the certificate um, being issued. On our side here, we've got lights that indicate the various processes and also lights in terms of so it will come up on the client side a green light on, on our side that, that the information is available and the analyst will start working on that uh, it will come up that it's in, in, in process and so it's, it's a wonderful tool um, that, that is used and here you can see in terms of the uploading of documentation um, that, that that comes up um, the, the, the scorecard aspects of, for example, this is just a slide uh, a, a pick that I took of, of, of this one in terms of uh, putting ownership information on and then it summarizes and gives scorecard details and that as it's progressing and, and unfolding. Um, and again, it can go into supply the detail of the scorecard and how the entity is scoring. Now, in addition to this, we've actually got a scenario planner um, that's linked to this that uh, we utilize internally and um, we then able to sit down with a client and actually go through and say, right, yes, your scorecard. Um, how if you did this or if you did the, that, what would the impact be under the scenario um, or, or, or that scenario? Just one thing that I want to mention um, while we've got this up is um, please have a look at it from your client's point of view. Um, you know, for somebody to say they, they're level one um, isn't nearly as attractive as an entity that will say, well, we're a level six or level seven, but we're 51% black owned or 30% black woman owned. All right, in terms of a, another opportunity that exists, and um, we found a number of clients that don't realize that, if you become part of the Youth Employment Service Initiative, besides the, the other benefits and the, the tax benefits, et cetera, that, that, that one receives, um, the BE codes came out um, with an amendment um, in 2018 that allows you to get BE benefits and to actually move up as much as two levels on your scorecard 
by being a part of the Youth Employment Service Initiative. So what I want to do is, is if you have a look here, if you achieve, um, there's certain targets that will there be there, and I'll, I'll talk about the very basics of this. We just don't have the time today for it. You can move up one BE recognition level. So you can move from the level eight to the level seven, the level two to, 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 to the level one. If you achieve one and a half times a year's target, and your absorption is 5% of those that complete their 12-month their contract are absorbed. Um, then you get three bonus points. And if you double the year's target and achieve that 5% absorption, you can move up two levels. So please understand when you're doing a scenario plan or gap analysis, look at this and look at the cost and the benefits because not only are those costs in terms of your, your skills development spend that gets recognized there, you can actually move up two levels. So this is significant um, when you have a number of clients that's looking at. Yes, there's certain criteria and qualification for, for registration. Um, if you're a generic entity, you must achieve at least 40% of the sub minimum under each of those priority elements. Remember there's the five, some people struggle, or you achieve it on average across all three priority elements. Then they talk about qualifying small enterprises where you achieve and the target is 40% is in two of the three, but they want ownership being um, one of those, one of the two. EMEs have no sub-minimum um, requirements. And um, yes, entities need to, you need to maintain or improve your BE status um, that you had in the, from the prior year. Um, and it does allow a phasing in um, period at any rate for the, for, for the first year, so you don't have to go through um, that particular hoop. Right, so what are these targets? The first target is um, linked to the headcount in the organization, one and a half percent of the headcount. Um, so you've got 100 people, you don't have one and a half people, you'll have two people. <laughs> if you um, also there's, you can, it, it gets benchmarked, remember it's the higher of, um, number two is one and a half percent of the NPAT um, and then divided, it, divided by 55,000 will give you um, the headcount or their targets in a table. We just don't have the time today to put those targets up but that um, is in a table that is there. And generally we find that um, companies look um, and, and the highest is um, the second one in relation to the NPAT figure. Eligible employees between 18 and 35, obviously they need to meet the definition of a black person as defined in the, in, in the codes. Um, they need to be in new positions, not a, in an existing position and subject to the basic conditions of, of, of employment. They must sign a fixed period or temporary um, contract um, and they must be given quality work experience um, provided by the, the employer. All right, clearly communicate that look at the end of the contract, there's no guarantee that you'll receive permanent placement. Um, said new jobs need to need to be created and if you don't have those number of employees you can sponsor new jobs um, that are placed within EMEs and, and, and QSEs um, and that will contribute to meeting those targets so those people don't even have to be necessarily um, within um, your own your own entity. All right, and that spend gets recognized in terms of the skills development um, element of, 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 of the scorecard and your informal training can increase, um, claim up to 50% from the 25% recategory category FNG, FNG spend. All right, and um, picking up now on, on, on the next one uh, point, and I'm not going to go into this in, in detail, um, and it wasn't on the heading, but I just want to talk about how important 51% black ownership is to your organization um, and that it is the new normal. So even those multinationals that have equity equivalents and they get recognition on the scorecard don't have this 51% um, target that they achieve. And please understand that the modified flow through principle cannot be applied in terms of looking at the, the, the black ownership. It's the normal flow through principle that applies, the modified flow through principle it only relates to specific aspects of the ownership scorecard and sometimes people get confused with that. 
So what we're finding is that organizations, run small entities, and certainly some large multinationals have had a look at something called a BBOS, a broad-based ownership scheme. Now, please, it's not a scheme as in a scam. <laughs> it's in the codes, it's defined in the codes, and there's certain criteria that these, these um, broad-based trusts need to meet in terms of the definition of beneficiaries, et cetera, but they're not that onerous. Um, but it allows you to achieve a 51% black ownership in relation to your company. So if you see the slide that I've put up there, the company itself may well create a new co and bring a division or uh, a, 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 an aspect of the existing company to bear, particularly in relation to supplying customers that are BE sensitive, and then achieving the 51% ownership and also being able to benefit the new co um, with the company at the tops. Um, um, uh, sorry, just in terms of that, that company's supply and enterprise development spend can also get recognized in the new co. So it's not only from an ownership point of view, it can in terms of enterprise and supplier development, and it can link into training and bursaries and other things in relation to, to the community. So. I would encourage people to look at it. Yes, you do have to go through through some hoops and yes, it needs to be genuine, but it is one solution for companies to look at achieving the 51% black, black ownership. So jokingly, you know, when you go and you, you're wanting to buy your surfboard from a surf shop, generally you're not going to ask for your, the, um, the supplier's BE credentials. If you get on a taxi, you know, you're not going to ask for the BE credentials, but believe you me, if you want to be in the formal economy in South Africa, you've got to start embracing um, these aspects that um, I've, I've spoken about um, today. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into a Q&A session, um, and if you've been able to, and you are able to submit questions, um, Jürgen will come on now and he will facilitate the questions. I will endeavor to answer them, or certainly we will get back to you at a later point um, with an answer to that. If I can just say that, that, that the last C, remember I spoke about your colleagues, your cash flow, your clients, your, your, your compliance, and the final one is really courage. Um, and we need to show courage in this time. There's a word for it, fosbate or mandalan wetu. Um, and we all know what uh, fosbate and mandalan wetu mean. Uh, so we need to do, have this, uh, this is courage in this time. So don't give up on these codes. And um, they may, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are ways of moving up in your scorecard. So even during lockdown, um, people saying to me, Tony, geez, how do we actually address this? We are in, so I'll take an example in the petroleum um, industry. We distributors, we got to bring in um, the, the, the fuel and it's a single channel and we're not getting our recognition for that. But yet we're 51% black owned. Uh, and in this one instance, a lot more than 51% black owned, but yet we're down at the level sevens. You know, how, my board are saying, how do we move up? And I'm saying, look at things like, like the YES initiative. Jürgen, over to you. Thank you. Hi, Tony. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we, we learn from you all the time. Um, it, really, it really is a pleasure and privilege to have you. Um, Tony, so I've been looking at the questions that's been coming through. Um, one of the questions, uh, just a general, general question, uh, when do you think the new transport sector codes will be gazetted? Yeah, there's one of us word down here called Andy Az. I, I don't know. Um, you know, it's, 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 there's obviously a lot at play in it. And um, I don't think during this lockdown down period and where the economy is at the moment, um, we should be um, tampering with, um, you know, business needs to know what are the rules of the game and to suddenly move the, the, the rules of the game. So when these sector codes have come out in the past, I've been highly critical because from the date they were gazetted, they, they're effective. And so it's really retrospective legislation because the people are going to get measured now on a scorecard that wasn't even there, whereas the measurement period, there was no rules to the game. So my sense of it, and, and, and I don't know um, when um, it, it's, it's going to happen. It will happen uh, one day, um, but hopefully in a more measured manner with proper notice periods and that. Perfect. Thank you, Tony. Um, there's another question that comes through. It says that is the procurement spend 
of a greater than 51% black owned business affected by their BE level. Um, so they want to know if they have a business larger than 51% black owned, do they still have to have a good BE level? Okay, so let's assume that they're not just a QSE because um, as, a, as a, a, a QSE, they get that automatic 100% recognition. If they want to go up to a higher level, well, they can get more. Um, my sense of it um, is that if you're a, a level four, so you, you know, a million rand, so 1.25 will be recognized. Um, as suspended as a level four. If you're a level one, it'll be 135% recognized and it'll be multiplied by the factor of 1.2. So yes, it, it, it does affect, even though you're more than 51% black owned, it actually does affect your score. Okay, perfect. Um, that makes sense. Okay, um, Tony, another question that's coming up. Uh, what effect will COVID have on the scorecard? Uh, now that companies are basically holding on to cash, would they still be willing to to spend? Um, and would would the B co act be relaxed for this year? Okay, so certainly there is absolutely no indication of of it being relaxed, and I think politically they're going to struggle to to, to relax the. The, the, the scorecard um, in relation to this. I think that question comes from, so for example, people are saying, Tony, we cannot, we just don't have the cash now to put into our enterprise and supplier development programs or the skill spend. We can't send people on, 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 on courses. And yes, you know, within an organization like that, we, like ours, we've got Learn Connect and people are doing the training, um, but they're not certified training, so it would go under the informal category. And people are saying, well, it's very, very difficult for us in relation to um, even with some companies with, with, with bursaries, you know. Um, and yes, whilst the universities have been able to, to continue, um, so the spend on the, on the res and all the rest of it is, isn't there. Um, what happens to those money? So there's, a, there's questions within questions there. But what companies are doing is they aren't necessarily incurring that spend. So let's take the tourism, hospitality, leisure industry. Um, they, you know, they, they're locked down. They're, well, they're not locked down, they're shut down. They, they, they close the doors, they want to continue. So they're limiting um, the, uh, the, the business operations. Some may be supplying some takeaways or, or something like that, but a number of them have just closed their establishments for now trying to keep the establishment there so that one day they can reopen and, and staff return and that's going to be a long time. So when you look at that, my answer is it's like benchmarking and benchmarking is when the lion chases you just make sure you can run faster than the slowest lion, oh, the, the, the slowest person because <laughs> this lion will hopefully grab that person and equally benchmark. So in that particular industry, in that sector, generally your competitors are also going to be impacted on um, in relation to their scorecard. Fantastic. So, so a question that then stems for, from that. So if you have to look at the impact of COVID with all the listed companies using uh, loan structures to assist B mm. ownership with share mm. value underpinning mm. the transaction. Yeah. The discussion, let's just say, of the share price on all markets, like you're talking about mm. the tourism, uh, it left most of these underwater. So how do you think listed companies are dealing with this? The, okay, the so it's quite interesting because when you go and look at the um, Formula A and B and that that calculation, and um, the total value of the of, of, of the shares have also reduced. So if you take a total share issued capital, excluding your treasury shares, put a value of the current ruling market price, and you take the BE shares. Um, so both your numerator and your denominator have reduced. Um, you know, and, and I'm not saying that's in every instance, but in many instances, that's what we're experiencing right now, um, doing those, those scorecards. Then, you know, it relates to, to the loans and, and all of that. That, that I can understand um, and, and, and the impact that that has on, on, on business being able to extend new loans and that. Um, other than the, in the equity, I'm talking about the benefit factor matrix as well. But I, I think understand your numerator and denominator numbers are changing. Uh, it's not just your your your, your numerator that's decreased. 
I mean, in terms of the value in, with your listed entities and that the whole market has moved downwards. And it, it also relates to mandated investments and others in terms of numerator denominator having been impacted on. I don't know if that answers it yep. or helps. Uh, yeah, no, I, I understand uh, fully. Um, the, there's a question that comes up. It says, mm. if a supplier scorecard expires during the measured financial year mm. and no new scorecard is available when the verification is done, does mm. a spend that supplier qualify for the full measured year even if the scorecard is expired, as long as it's expired during the measured year? Does that make sense yeah. to you for me? Yeah, no, absolutely. The question makes sense because that, that is so. Um, and again, there's a lot of aspects of uh, the interpretation of the codes and the way verification agencies deal with it. Um, and so you've got to apply substance over form and a lot of arguments in relation to that. But this, the industry norm is that as long as there is a valid certificate within the measurement period. So in other words, if we performing the verification today. The measurement period was 31 December um, 2019. As long as there's a certificate for in that period of 1 January 2019 to 31 December 2019, um, we will accept that certificate, even though the spend might have been incurred after the date that the certificate expired. OK, so let's extrapolate that now into 2021 and in relation to 2020, 2020, there would have to be a certificate if we're doing the verification next year's verification um, in July um, 2021, that measurement period of the calendar year 2020 would have to have a valid certificate. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Tony, a very interesting question that has also popped up. Uh, so it says skills development. Um, in the course, it does talk about schools. Uh, for what we're currently going through with COVID at the moment, many uh, scholars in, in rural areas especially are not getting the schooling, um, are not getting access to, to education. Could some of your skills development and the codes and what's it meant to do be able, can some of this be used for, for school and for kids? Um, as well. Sorry, are you saying the sorry to, to, to the enterprise and supply development spend being used uh, in that? No skills development. Skills oh, skills development, de absolutely. Yes, it does does allow for that. That is in terms of um, the the change in the definitions that I've just spoken about earlier um, in relation to that. So most certainly, you can direct spend. Um, to to scholar programs and that and that gets recognised um, in terms of skills development spend, not the bursaries, but the skills development spend. So it's just something that I, I didn't mention. You can't double count. So if you make a bursary available for somebody a high educational institution, you can't recognise that. Let's say it's fifty thousand um, under that category for the bursary and under skills development spend. But certainly under skills development spend, you can recognise the payment to, to schools and, 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 and for scholar education, but they need to be with the Department of, of, of um, Education recognized um, um, school, yeah. Fantastic. Um, uh, Tun, we've got uh, about two minutes left. The last question comes yeah. from myself. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm really passionate about uh, assisting small businesses, <laughs> yes. and especially to grow. I read an interesting article by the Harvard uh, Business uh, Review. It was an article that said the new norm for company strategy is to invest in your supply chain. So when companies are deciding which products to sell now, um, you know, they need to go back to the supply chain check. Do I have a steady supply chain? Um, and I should actually be investing in it. Is this what the codes under enterprise and supply development is also trying to achieve? And is this something that that's important, do you think? Yeah, uh, you're going absolutely. I think what, you know, the new normal is digitalization. We, we, we've got to change the way business was done. And, you know, you see it with, um, with, with colleagues, you see it with clients, people, you know, are saying, listen, and they've got to be innovative. We've got to embrace digitalization. And so even with digitalization and with supply chains and with um, take a lot delivering products, um, you know, for those people that, that, that have these particular use those channels, 
um, mm. you've got to be innovative with it. Um, so we're not going to go back to anything. We're going to, it, it's something new. Um, so if, if companies aren't innovative in terms of, of, of the future and the way they do it and how they're going to get product to market or or whatever it is um, that they're doing. So we've had you know, a, a company, and I'm going to be talking about this when I deal with the, the family businesses. Um, we're a family business and we're going since the 1800s. And literally COVID has forced them to shut down, but they didn't change with the times. They, 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 they should have changed long ago. The senior generation, you know, 80s, 90s, not letting go. The next generation already retiring. And, and so that creates a whole cascade effect. People have to be innovative. You've got to embrace the change, look at digitalization. And what we're finding in those businesses is that the next generation is coming through and, and they're embracing this, this change. So, you know, I'm just going to conclude. Courage, fast bait, or mandalan way to, you know, just, just go for it. Go hard, go fast, go for glory. But you've got to embrace the change. Um, life's not fair. I mean, we didn't need ESCOM having shutdowns at this time, but it's happened. You know, how are we going to work around that in a digitalized economy? Thank you. Tony, well done. And you've even, you've concluded, uh, I think the, that that the, the thought that you left up with, hold on, move forward, you know, do the best that you can. Um, Tony, let me take this opportunity to thank you for your time. I see there's a lot more questions that has come through. Um, can I please appeal to you? To, you can reach out directly to Tony, uh, his email address was given and you'll be able to um, liaise with him directly. Tony, thank you very much. I really appreciate it and look forward to more uh, sessions with you. So please keep up the great work. Thanks, Jürgen. Thanks, Thanks for participants, clients, colleagues very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Be safe. Bye-bye.